Can you just ask me what, what brought you here? Look, the main reason I attended today, um, I was a head signed up for your news there a, a little while ago, yeah. seeing that advertised, um, the seminar advertised. I'm establishing a division for the business that I work for that's getting into the facade remediation space, which will cover, of course, flammable cladding. Mm -hmm. I was particularly interested though into seeing what advice and what approach body corporates were going to be taking to this issue right. because obviously there's a lot of them and there's a lot of issues with dealing with body corporates and the inquiry we're getting so far from uh, coming into is mainly coming from institutional owners and not too much from apartment owners or body corporates and I think that's partly because they don't know how to go about it or who to approach. And that's what brought me here. I was just interested to see how they are being advised. Mm -hmm. And obviously also to start getting our message out to those people. Yeah, and what's your message? Our message is that um, we can assist. I was particularly interested in Peter's uh, from Cause talk. He outlined steps that um, owners of buildings should go through to make sure they do it correctly and do it quickly and efficiently. And that involves an initial investigation. And those are services we can offer right through from the initial investigation, the um, recommendations for remediation in, in conjunction with consultants such as Peter, and then um, giving them a cost plan to actually do the works. Yeah. Like we, can, we can undertake those works or we can they can take then our recommendations out to the market if they want to test the market for the competitive price. Mm -hmm. So how do people get in touch with you? Um, we're getting a little start. We've just established the web page um, which is starting to get picked up now with Google searches up mm -hmm. optimization. Um, attending seminars such as this and sponsoring we sponsored the um, Safe Building and Cladding Summit that was held at the Sheriff and just up the road here yeah. a couple of weeks ago, I think it was. So we were my principal sponsors there, so they got the message out. Yeah, yeah. And um, I guess through engaging with um, organisations such as yours, um, to help get our message out to your members. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And that's what brought me. Yeah, oh, lovely. Well, we'll help you in any way yeah. we can. Okay. What brought you here today? Well, I heard about this uh, information being given today on uh, the cladding panels, and it's something that's affecting a building of mine, so I was so interested to come and find out what I could, and it's just been so rewarding. Fantastic. So what's, what's been your biggest takeaway, would you say? Well, I've learned so much about how there is great differences between the panels and all one brand and it's very very hard to determine so we do need to specialize and get some expert advice yep. and the opportunity to, to have the potential to join a class action is a very very useful. Oh good, so that's going to be your next step do you think? Well I'm going to be looking into that very closely, I've got to speak to my committee and get them engaged but um, today has been very enlightening for me, oh, worth, worth every moment I've spent here, so grateful to have the opportunity. So good, that's really awesome, thank you so much. Thanks for the, inviting me. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. So Paul, um, today come along to OCN's Flammable Cladding event. What brought you here today? Well, uh, we have a building with some cladding issues on it and uh, the owner's uh, corporation network has been really fantastic in helping us you know, work our way through it. It's a difficult and complex problem and, uh, and we're delighted with the assistance and the support and with a, an event like today to help us through it. So. Mm -hmm. And so how far are you navigating the the journey through this this one? Oh, um, we're still in a little bit of limbo. We're, we're, we still have some engineers reports and some uh, some dealings with our builder uh, to, to work through. Mm -hmm. um, we're a little bit different to what a lot of the other people here spoke about. We have steel, uh, colour bond steel, kingspan cladding, which is not aluminium, uh, but it's still uh, wrapped into that legislation that makes it uh, um, you know, suspect, so to speak. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's a long journey, but hopefully we'll get there. Yes, yeah, yeah, and then OCN can help you along that journey. Oh, indeed, they've been absolutely great. Yeah, yeah. and I, I've had a good talk to uh, Phil last Friday, and and uh, he worked through a few issues with me in that regard, mm -hmm. and uh, and. Um, 
Karen's been wonderful and given us some good advice too. And uh, yeah. and the forums have been the OCN forums have been amazing. There's some really interesting bits and pieces on that. So yeah. I've only been a member of OCN for probably a month or six weeks, but in that time I've uh, I've tried to make use of the resources that they offer and uh, the forums in particular have a diverse and broad range of subjects that are really uh, interesting and really you know helps yeah. us greatly. Yeah, oh, it's good. That's so yeah. good to hear. Yeah. That's great. That's really good. Thank you so much for coming okay. along today. Thanks very and, uh, much. Yeah, see, you, see you soon. No okay. Um, so, flammable cladding, defects. <coughs> Boeing 737-8 falling out of the sky. Do they turn around to the people who bought tickets and say, oh, you're going to have to pay to fix this? Volkswagens cheated on their emissions. Do they say to the people who bought Volkswagens, ah, oh, sorry, you're going to have to pay for new software for old Volkswagens? People who live in the bush, who have chosen to live in tree, and among trees that nature has designed to burn ferociously, do we say to them, well, it's your choice. You've chosen to live in these dangerous places, so you have to pay for the fire brigade, you have to pay for the fire break, you have to pay for everything that will save you and your house. No, we don't. Because as a community, as a society, we believe people should have the choice, should be able to make those choices, and, you know, swings and roundabouts, things balance out at the end of the day, we hope. What I believe is fair trading should not be a code word for punish the victim. But when all else fails, we the owners have to pay for problems that we never asked for, caused by people who should have known better. And today, we're going to find out how to fix that. Our first speaker has degrees in science, engineering and business administration. His career included reform and regulation of the electricity industry, managing pricing regulation and business strategy for a large electricity company as well as private consulting. Over the past 10 years, he has served in a number of strata committees. As both treasurer and chairman, he has managed a home warranty insurance claim which settled for almost $3 million and oversaw the subsequent building rectification works, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome the chairman of OCN, Phil Gold. But um, what I do find when I talk to the members of our organisation is that uh, a very rich array of professional and strata scheme experiences to draw on. Um, there are people here today <coughs> when, when, when I came in that are both committee members but also bring specialist expertise from their long careers. Um, that is actually, uh, and I also find that uh, among our members, those folk are also the ones that are very willing to share that experience. Uh, and therein lies the strengths. One of our major strengths as an organisation. It's members helping members. And helping government for that matter, uh, by sharing their experiences and solutions with a range of, of problems. I suspect that um, quite a few of you here today have invaluable skills and experience which we can share with others on the cladding. Uh, issues and I encourage you to talk to each other at morning tea and lunch and, and, and start that process. As an organisation, uh, we've also had success with action groups focused on addressing problems of common interest. Flammable cladding is a specific problem within a wider set of building defect issues which may benefit from such a focus and that's the purpose of getting people together today. With this in mind, I wanted to expand a little bit on uh, the benefits of working together as part of an organisation like the Ames Corporation Network. Um, working with government to deliver appropriate policy and administrative responses to strata issues, including flammable planning. And uh, the prospect or the possibility of setting up some kind of um, focused action group uh, on the cladding issues. I'll take each of those points in turn and expand them a little bit. Um, Members helping members, uh, the Owners Corporation Network has endless examples of owners helping owners with strata issues generally and, uh, re and in residential building management issues in particular. Already with Plating, we have one member scheme that is well down the track in arranging the necessary rectification involving millions of dollars of plating replacement. 
they are outside the, the six year period, so they're willing to dealing with um, uh, funding it themselves and finding ways to fund it. The knowledge and experience that we've gained, that's gained by that scheme, has been shared with other members already, um, as well as helping us with uh, our engagement with the government on this issue. I have to say, we, we've got hundreds of members, but not, you know, there's, there's thousands of buildings in this state that have got flammable cladding issues, but there's still only a small proportion of the total schemes. So this is an issue that affects a relatively small proportion of our membership. Um, we're finding it quite challenging getting, getting uh, people who are outside the membership to come and see the benefits of working with those people. Indeed, the Owners Corporation Network owns, owes its existence to the realisation among a number of schemes that the challenges they face are the same as the challenges facing other schemes. Dealing with building defects in your apartment buildings was one of those common challenges right from day one, some almost 20 years ago now. I wasn't here, uh, but those who were uh, know the experience and it's legend within the organisation. People have learned from each other about the processes for recovering costs and, de and delivering rectification projects. As Jimmy mentioned, I've been through that process myself. Um, it's, um, you know, the, you know got, you've got the technical side, you've got the financing side, you've got the committees, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, so we had to do it, learn all those sort of uh, things ourselves. Uh, and bring it and, and the dealing with the decision processes within each scheme is probably the most challenging challenging area. Someone was talking to me um, earlier before before I got up about uh, uh, their scheme wanting to um, put special levies on to do things, and the tension between that the need to do something and the pensioners in the building that don't want to pay it. So, it's, so certainly in my experience it can be challenging getting some owners to recognise their responsibilities for ensuring the building is safe. Uh, all too often it's the insurance companies or a fire order from council that forces the issue. And then there's the potential wrangless arguments about the best technical option, levy impacts, cost recovery, um, and inexperienced and poorly motivated committee members compound these problems in some schemes. It's, I've, I've experienced that, it's quite, a, it's quite a challenge. It's real. At our seminars, we've introduced owners to a range of uh, strata scheme service providers, and there are some of those here today, so I was encouraged to talk amongst yourselves, as well as having owners sharing their own experiences with real life dilemmas. Uh, we have um, one of our board members who's heading up a little group at the moment uh, on uh, infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure, ex particular experience uh, with Telstra, and he's helping our members work out how best to use redundant infrastructure that occurs when the MDN system goes in. That's a good example of the sorts of things we can do when we get together. Um, we have issues choosing the right, all have issues choosing the right strata managers, facility managers, and expert technical consultants. We're currently working together with some of the facilities management companies and interested members uh, on a piloting and accreditation arrangements for facilities managers. Anybody can be a facilities manager. They don't have to have accreditation. They simply have to persuade you that they can look after your building. That's something that needs to be addressed. Other areas of member collaboration include lift management, security management, containment control, short-term holiday letting within residential apartments and energy efficiency improvements. Almost daily, individual experiences are shared on our internet-based forums and on Jimmy's excellent forum, Flat Chat as well, I might add. Uh, definitely uh, definitely uh, an insight into the uh, challenges of strata land. As we grow our membership, we're looking to improving member support services, um, focusing on better user information about the various service providers and services that are out there. So um, if you, I've got to, I've collected some cards from some of the providers today already, thank you. I will, we'll, we'll certainly talk to you. A critical area of activity is influencing government and its effects on strata living. With a state election at a critical point, this has been a key focus area for us. Turning to that issue of improving policy and regulation, strata schemes. By and large, government has a poor grasp of strata living and the issues facing residential owners, and it's particularly in strata. 
This is reflected in the allocation of responsibilities within government and the day-to-day -day thinking on residential issues, strata issues generally. Almost always when you talk to people from government, they start with the position on, res on anything to do with strata, they think from the point of view of a house and land. They don't live in strata or at least they just don't get it. As has been shown by the flammable cladding issue, government is not as proactive as it can be and it should, and, and it should be in helping owners. A simple request to let people know who are on the, the uh, high risk list, we're holding a seminar to try and get people together, um, was, was rejected. I understand that, I would have understood that if I hadn't started speaking to our members and found that in fact they weren't getting any help from government at all anyway. They were only just getting hassled. So, um, which is really quite surprising because I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's government, poor government regulation that's actually allowed us, or lack of regulation that's got us into this position in the first place. So despite these attitudes, our organisation, the Owners Corporation Network, has been successful in influencing policy outcomes. We do this with direct engagement, relevant ministers, their staff, their departments. We also speak to the relevant opposition members and their staff. We currently have an active engagement program with candidates in the more marginal seats that have high concentrations of residential strata. Recently too, due to the Opal Tower fascos and payment flammable cladding events in Melbourne, we've been able to access media coverage on the building defects issues with further engagement um, and further engagement with both government and opposition. We're getting, they're competing with policy announcements at the moment on that area. It's wonderful to see, but long overdue. Only this week, um, we were able to call out, we got media coverage to call out the, that ordinary response to flammable cladding that um, we referred to earlier. Media loves the human interest angle, and members of our organisation who are prepared to share their difficult experiences in the mainstream media are invaluable. There's nothing like a real life story of someone copying 60, 70,000 special levies on a pension to fix flammable cladding to get attention. The foundation of effective engagement is actually the set of documented policy proposals that we've prepared. Uh, that's, what, that's our reference point, and they are at the desk when you walked in as a set of policies that we've, we, we've um, put together to act as the foundation in dealing with government on what needs to be done in Australia. I hope you pick one up. Importantly, though, we have yet to develop a policy, a specific policy for flammable cladding which is one of the possible tasks for the group that we wanted to create out of today's uh, exercise. Coming to that group, we found that specific act, issue action groups are proving to be an effective way of harnessing knowledge and resourcing effective action. By way of example, the OCN Action Group on Short-Term Letting has achieved some very significant outcomes for members over the past couple of years and continues to do so. First, we achieved the express right within the legislation, within the legislation, went through Parliament, for owners' corporations to create a bylaw prohibiting short-term letting by non-resident owners. There was a question mark hanging over that power until that legislation passed through <coughs> Parliament recently. It is yet to be proclaimed because the rest of the package is in, is in la-la land pending the election. Nevertheless, um, we were able to do that because we had an action group of members who were affected by the issue and they contributed special purpose funds that targeted uh, some media relations activity, particularly on ventures. Secondly, the action group is now working on a range of detailed policy implementation issues led by one of our uh, excellent board members. Who, by the way, and I must acknowledge our, our new board, we have some fantastic talent on board, um, former parliamentary draftsman, a planning lawyer, uh, a gentleman who runs his own, uh, self-manages his own scheme. How am I going, Jimmy? Two minutes. Two minutes, I'm nearly there. Okay, um, so I, 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 I'd be remiss not to acknowledge uh, the excellent, excellent board and, uh, and of course our executive officer, Karen Stiles, who is the backbone of the organisation. But the, the, these are all volunteers. They bring their talent, as I mentioned, to the organisation, and, and those policy documents that you've got are a product of that work. Um, we have a former uh, strata, strata lawyer on the 
but when we've got all, um, uh, a gentleman who's been and supported uh, Owners Corporation Network for many, many, many years, who chairs a 200 plus lot of chats with. So it's, it's, it's uh, I, I, I keep doing this because of these people. The work with these people is a privilege. Um, <clears throat> So we've got, us, got these people on these action group uh, on short-term letting. Uh, we, they're, they're, they're working behind the scenes on the detailed implementation of the short-term letting policy. It's a disaster uh, in many ways. It needs to be, it's a lot of hard work, but we've got the government stopped in their tracks on the code of conduct. Um, we've got the uh, opposition talking about registration um, to help enforce the new code, which they weren't interested in, the government wasn't interested in at one stage. So these are all things that we're achieving. We've got a pro forma bylaw uh, being prepared on that particular topic, uh, paid for, so that'll be at low cost to our members. Everybody will be affected by the same issue, the short-term letting. Um, and finally, most importantly, our members in that activity are sharing practical ways in which to contain and control short-term letting within their schemes. Right now, there is insufficient organised engagement with government on the wider public to protect interests of apartment owners affected by fundable cladding. We don't have an action group like we have for short-term lending for fundable cladding. There is no meaningful assistance from government with the processes required, the type of expertise used, uh, financing options and funding recovery or any other matter. The government may have declared fundable cladding to be a major defect and thus subject to statutory warranties under the Home Building Act. But it has left the fight over the legality of that to the, indi to the individual apartment complexes affected. They don't, they don't want to fund the legal fight, they don't even want to advocate it. They simply say, oh, okay, we'll declare a major defect over to you, individual apartment owners. Some schemes, um, more than two years old, less than six years old, have this crucial battle in front of them to actually prove that they're legally entitled to recovery under that. Why should schemes facing this situation? Why can't they combine their resources to improve their chances in the courts? For those of you uh, in the, in the, in, who are beyond six years, uh, the class actions that we talk about today are particularly pertinent. Um, you may find a path to recovery uh, by having a common target builder. You may find the path to recovery by a manufacturer. I'll leave that to Julian to, to deal with, but, but um, depending on whether you're a, a new building, a building that's two years old, less than six years old, or whether you're older than six years, you've got a different path to follow. But if you can find other folk in the same position as yourself and get together, that's where, that's where things can happen. Most importantly, I'm confident when schemes affected by funding plating start to share their experiences, there will be common targets for redress. I'm confident that the lessons of one scheme with technical advisors and solutions will be of value to another. I'm confident that our chances of improving government support for effective schemes will improve significantly if we can develop sound policy proposals together and work together to have them adopted. Low interest finance was something that Paul uh, from Lanark was uh, uh, talking about when I spoke to him some time ago. Um, the people who can raise the cheapest money in this state, in the state of New South Wales, they can give you interest rates way lower than anybody else. So uh, I'm getting, I'm almost there, Jimmy. But uh, I want to finish on an important note. Um, we're hoping that this is the beginning of an action group open to the hundreds, if not thousands, of affected schemes uh, in, in, in New South Wales. At the very least, if you or your scheme is not already a member of our organisation, please join. I've got the forms there. Um, they're at the front desk. Uh, in any event, uh, I trust that you'll find the rest of this morning useful. Um, and I hope you make useful contacts with your particular challenges. Our next speaker has been engaged in facade design, manufacturer installation and certification throughout Asia Pacific and Middle East for the last 20 years. Peter has gained a deep insight into the machinations and foibles associated with facade remediation. In procurement and project delivery, yes, he says, he wrote, yes, there is scar tissue, and yes, it is from the commercial construction industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Carter.
So, as Jimmy outlined, my background is in commercial construction. I've been designing, manufacturing, installing, involved in the certification process. From compliance checks, fire, burns, facade performance tests. So, what I've done is I've gone through the process that we're engaged in at the moment. So, we're working on a number of properties around Australia that have concept cap plating that is defective and it does burn. So just an outline, I'm sure you're, you've been through the process of the Grenfell fire, the La Crosse building fire, but there's another one that sort of doesn't get much media attention. And this is in Bangkok in 2007, 2008, and it was the um, uh, twin tower development, 48 storeys, the cyber towers. Demonstrates is if you see the panel falling off and disengaging. So, the main aspect of polyethylene panels is that fire propagates up, down, and to the sides. Wow, look at all that falling off. So, that's an oversized ACP sheet. So, wherever that lands, the, flight, the flame propagates and it still has a fuel load on it. So the other interesting thing about this is it's a twin tower development. So this is before construction. Construction had just completed, they were due to open in five weeks, six weeks. So the second tower has gone up as well. That's a pissed off subby. So the subby hasn't been paid, so he's come back and torched it. Well, somebody had better call the insurance company. Clearly. <laughs> So I'll just leave that. So that's the, when people talk about it's flammable cladding, it really is. All it takes is a penetration to expose the core and then you have a fuel load. The fuel load can be ignited from cigarettes, it can be ignited from dumpster fires, it can be ignited with a cigarette lighter. It doesn't take much. The panel's always offset from the structure, so you're creating a chimney. So that chimney effect then draws the flame up. The main problem with it is, as I said before, the flame propagates up, vertically up, vertically down, and can go off to the sides and ignite other sources. So that's why we're here. And that's why there's been such a dramatic reaction to flammable cladding around the world. Because the implications of it, traditionally it's a remedial pathway. So they're going on and they're dropping it onto a building that may be 25, 30 years old, and they've decided that exposed aggregates are it's past its date. We don't like looking at it anymore. Let's put some pretty flat surfaces up there with you know, modern colours. By doing that, you still have a building that's 35, 40 years old. So the fire performance capability of that building is dated. So the fire can go up, can go in, the window performance isn't up to the standard, and then you have an internal fire. Grenfell was particularly bad because there was a single exit source for residents. The residents were told to stay in their apartments. They were told that they had fire doors that had a two hour rating. They didn't. They'd just been given normal doors. So then when you see the, you know, the aftermath of it, the fire propagation into the apartments is just horrendous. So uh, something had to be done. As to why this crap product went around the world, it's money. It's money, it's efficiency in manufacture, and the regulations just weren't there. They let it in everywhere. Singapore, Australia, you name it. It's the garbage. I like patented metals myself. So these are the other ones. Um, so it's, it's upsetting for me to be you know, in this position that we're having to go back and remediate structures that aren't that old, that they shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be in this position. So the regulatory, the ACP reporting requirements are quite interesting based on the various state governments. They've, they've got more commonality in the standards that they require for performance now, but the reporting and the disclosure requirements and the pathways that they're undertaking are vastly different. Victoria's led the charge, so they've been at the forefront along the way. They're very open. They have full disclosure about the buildings they've inspected. They have a, the VBA is more of a 
a quasi-government body, so they don't have that private enterprise aspect to it, where you've got a, you know, a certifier who's been working with a building contractor for 10 years, and then, you know, we want to use you on the next job, mate, so. Queensland's quite good. I'm from Queensland, so obviously. <laughs> the QDC, so you have to self-report. That's the onus on it. In New South Wales, you self-report, you then get a fire order. The fire order pathway is actually better, I believe, than going through the DA approval process. It, it happens a lot faster, which means that you can cut your cost down. Short term makes so. So, you need to get someone involved. You need to have someone, a professional, to come out, assess the building, and obviously, if you haven't determined what sort of ACP you've got, you need to do that then and there. Take core samples. Have core samples done, have them analysed. The cost of testing is normally $660 a sample. It's a 20 mil piece. But that will tell you whether you have 100% polyethylene, you have a 70-30 split, or you have another hybrid. Traditionally, you can look at the panel and you can see, you can hear it if it's ACP, it has a different audible quality. But you can also, by the colour, you can tell if it's 100% polyethylene, or it may be a, um, oh God, it's, it's not polyo, mate. It, it's another resin material. It's not as bad as polyethylene, but it has a more granular structure. There's not many of the panels used in Australia, but it's an Australian machine. You then want to start planning. The key to an efficient commercial project or a remediation project is understanding exactly what you have. Understand all the materials, understand how you're going to access it, understand how to deliver it. If you put the pre-planning in, you can cut down the time on site, and that's the key. Efficiency on site. So what I've done is just outline this on the remediation. It's intrusive investigations, it's pulling panels off, having a look behind there, seeing whether you have other non-compliant materials, seeing that, can I get them off readily? Has someone used double-sided tape, VHB tape, which is just the garbage? Has they put it together in a manner that allows for remediation, another panel to come onto it? Is the subframe in good condition? Can I recycle the subframe? If you can recycle the subframe, your time on site and your material cost drops dramatically. It's a simple like-for-like -like replacement. Obviously not the same crap, but that's what it is. The whole process that you want to go down is efficiency on site. Have a contractor go in there, understand what the materials are, have them manufactured in advance, and then go through the cycle. You need to be able to corral and put together what your cost exposure is going to be. If you leave it and you have surprises when you're on site, the durations go further. You'll get hit with standing time, you'll get hit with um, EOT, extension of time claims, and your risk exposure goes up. The really interesting thing in remediation is the cost exposure and how it breaks down. The panels themselves, they're not a large part of the cost. The cost is in the access. How you access a project is key, but it has to be done safely, it has to be done efficiently, and you have to have minimum disruption to the other tenants, to the process. To do that means that you're using a variety of That's the cost exposure. Duration on getting to the work. <coughs> so, once again, pre-planning. <coughs> Understand it. Do the designs. Have the verification process in place before you even set foot on site. Access, just to break that down of the processes that you can get away with. Not get away with, that you can efficiently remediate the facade. Mask climbers. Mask climbers is effectively a tower that fixes to the structure and it provides a solid working platform. You can load it up. So you have more materials, which means you have more efficiency, which means that you can then deliver the works more expeditiously. Scaffolding, it's a traditional system. It's 
visually intrusive, but it's a safe way to access the site. The difficulty with scaffolding is that traditionally you'll stand off 500 to 600 millimetres off the face of the facade, which makes it more problematic putting materials on. If you can have a system that you're removing an elevation and then you're going straight back up again, you'll get off the site a lot faster, which means that your risk exposure comes down, which means that your cost exposure comes down. There's a variety. Rope access. Rope access is ideal for investigation. It's ideal for small remediation, but you know, six guys hanging off a building on a gossamer thread with a hook through their belly button, it's not efficient. You won't have that many, you know, it, visually not so intrusive, but you will not have that efficiency. Um, ones I don't like, uh, swing stage. Swing stage is basically a uh, framework that's put on the roof and then cables coming down and a platform that hangs off that. It's unstable, it's, I just don't like them. They're, you can't load them up, you can't put materials on, which means that your duration on site goes up. Elevated work platforms, scissor lifts, they're good, but they're limited. It's low areas, you have to have a flat surface. You have to be able to access the face of the building. And it means that you're disrupting people's movement around the building. So they're the things to look at. You need to have someone have a look at them. Material options. There's been a huge process going through around the states to determine what is the standard to test these materials to. What is a standard that's reflective of the industry requirements, fire and safety, and available materials in the market, given that there's still an obsession with a flat surface with pretty colours. When you look at it, the common ground is a standard called AS 1530.1. That's the baseline. And that's New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, South Australia, NT, I don't think they do it up there. There's another standard which is 5113 which is a full-scale fire test. It's effectively four storeys, and they put a fire load below it, and then they burn it. The problem with 5113, no one can pass it in its entirety. There has a debris requirement. You can't have more than two kgs of debris coming from the facade. Sold aluminium can't pass it. Composite panels definitely can't pass it. Only steel face panels can pass it. So what they've settled on is 1530.1. That will give you a deemed to satisfy product, which means that your cost exposure in engineering, fire engineering certification, comes down dramatically. It's the pathway to do. So material options, I like three millimetre, four millimetre aluminium plate. The difficulty with it is that you will not get a flat surface. In three millimetre and below, it oil cans, so it, it's a ripple wave effect. In four millimetre up and up, you get plate distortion, which basically the plate kinks. It doesn't kink badly, but you can see it as a distortion. You can put stiffeners behind it, you can try to you know, true it up, but once you get oversized panels, that's what you're going to read. You'll see a distortion. There's new generation concept panels on the market now, which is an aluminium honeycomb and a hot melt um, adhesive, which enables them to pass 1530.1. Traditionally, the problem with honeycomb, aluminium honeycomb has been delamination in thermal variation. Sun hits it, wind hits it, rain hits it, and the whole thing comes away. The new generation are definitely more adept at it, and it's a better performing material, but it's still a composite panel. Patinated zinc, doesn't get any better. Beautiful material. Lasts, looks good, performs, but it's a rain screen system, which means that it does allow moisture, it does allow environmental materials to get behind it. If you close it off, it eats itself out, which is becomes another problem. What do I do with my substrate? How do I deal with my substrate? What should I seal it with? 
should I try to improve the facade performance as a whole? But the thing is also it's very expensive, comparatively speaking. Copper, same, and GRC. GRC is a grass, glass reinforced concrete. It's lightweight, it looks very good, and you can do it in certain moulds, patinations, it performs well. But the weight load goes up, so your subframe system may not be able to cope with that additional load. Contractor engagement, design considerations, contractor engagement, uh, certification of statutory requirements. That all comes down from getting early engagement. Have a professional come through, look at the structure, work out your pathway. If you can do that, you will cut down your duration and you'll cut down your risk exposure. So that's the process. It, it's, it's very broad, but it's an en engaged process. You need to understand and corral what your problem is. Does your building benefit from improving thermal performance? Does your building benefit from improving other materials and other systems? You're already paying for the access equipment to get in there to be able to access that facade. What other works should you be doing while you're there? New windows, remediation windows. Improve the thermal build-up of the structure. Improve the acoustic performance of the structure. The cost requirements for the additional works are 30% effectively it's you're better off doing it all while you're there and as painful as it may be but that's the only benefit to come out of it besides not having a building that burns thank you a, a, an alleged expert said that if you were to remove every second panel you would create a fire break so we don't need to remove all the panels and we could save half the money I know what you're going to say. Try and keep it clean. <laughs> when, traditionally when you do a facade, particularly with a curtain wall, you'll have a fire break per floor level and that's part of the containment strategy for the internal aspect of the, fire, of the building for under fire. On external fires, as you've seen that lovely film of mine, polyethylene propagates flame like napalm. It just keeps burning and going and going. It burns up, it burns down, it burns off to the side. If you put a fire break in at every second panel, you're still getting panels coming off. Right. As soon as they disengage, because the fixing is through the side walls of the panel. So traditionally, you'll put a route cut in it and then you'll put a break in it to get a nice clean edge. The fixing then goes through that part. So as soon as it catches on, there's no engagement. The panel's on fire and it cascades down. How about water that sprinklers? Was my point. No. Yeah, that's good. Um, how about water sprinklers? No. Because of the fire load, traditionally your building will have a sprinkler system that's designed for a certain fire load, an interior. The fire load on with polyethylene panels exceeds the water pressure that traditionally that you can get up into it. You're putting, trying to put a petrochemical fire out with water. It takes a huge water load to be able to do it, and it's just not feasible. There's a lovely company that actually produced a sprinkler system that shoots out from the building, and they've got sensors on it, and then it'll direct its novel to the fire. Wow. Right. Okay, and now, now some sensible questions. Again, sticking with um, AS 1530.1, mm. which is the current standard, yeah. what I'm trying to get my head around is, in the past, I guess there were standards, what went wrong? Was there, was there no standard? Was the standard not applied? Or was the standard different? The standard was manifestly inadequate. It was a burn test on a sample like that, and it was a face burn. So you've got an aluminium face, and you're putting a flame to it for an inadequate period of time, and it passes that and jobs right. Personally, I believe that the regulatory authorities have been asleep at the wheel for a long period of time. 2007, we knew that this stuff, when the materials first came on the market in the 90s, um, it was, you know, what is it? It's crap. It's crap. Don't put it up. But, you know, and that's what it is. It's commercial construction doing a VE. Phil? I was going to ask about, uh, there's a lot of sense up here. Uh, Someone else wrote for Yeah, but I mean, as, as, a, as a first, one of the challenges I had was convincing 
by committee members of all those steps, uh, saying that they, you know, they didn't want to pay for consultant fees, they didn't want to pay for this, they didn't want to pay for one car, just get my cousin in to do it. Yeah. You know, um, that was a real challenge for me. Yeah, for sure. How, how do you, how have you, in your client base, work, seen that work well or where, where it's worked badly? What's the right people? Is it the strata managers? The, Committee it's, people, or is it the um, uh, the building facilities managers, or a combination of both? It's a combination of all of the above, but it has to be. It, it's quite straightforward the process. Everyone's been engaged in some form of dealings with the builders or building industry, and everyone's had either a good experience or knows of a bad experience. And when the durations blow out or materials fall from height, that is the end of it. You know, death from above. I've been working at height for 25 years. It's it's a dreadful thing. So you have to go through that reputable process. But the thing is that your cost will come down significantly <coughs> by pre-planning. Understanding your problem. Put it there. Don't have things popping up halfway through a process. Any other questions? Yes. Did you say that the core sampling had to be on, on pieces in 20 centimetre diameter? Uh, 20 mil. 20 mil. 20 mil. Right. So it's, it's a simple core hole. Um, yes. we'll leave, from my point of view, we'll either go out, we'll hang off the side of a building with a cordless, lane it up, and drill it out, take the core sample away, patch the panel, because the, the thing that you don't want to do is expose the core <coughs> more than it is. And you said a certain colour was a, a dead giveaway. What was what were the certain? Black. Shiny black. Wow. That's good to know. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't think it's quite as simple as saying it's aluminium uh, panelling. We've got a colour bond steel panel, mm. uh, composite, king span, yep. with a poly iso cyanide, yep. I think it is, which is non flammable, you know, it doesn't gas. Everything's gas. flammable. Well, you know, the test that we've seen yeah, is of saying it chars, yeah. but it doesn't burn, doesn't promote that. Mm. Yet we're still roped in, you know, we're still looking at... You have to go through the process. Well, huge process. And at the moment, we've been through three fire engineers, three engineering companies, that won't sign off on it because of the, the I think, from the lacrosse uh, mm. uh, thing where they're now in panic mode. Correct. They are, uh, if the material is not DTS, then you're satisfied, you are very much on an uphill battle because it requires a um, fire engineering solution, an assessment to be done, mm. which is typically 30,000, 40,000. Mm. So, uh, just with um, brands of the flammable cutting? They're all branded. They all produced it. So this yeah. Doesn't matter where it, who is manufacturing it, Alpilot, Luca Bond, um, Simonite, they all had non-compliant materials as a value exercise. The interesting thing is that sign, external signage, originally when they were putting the process through, they were still allowing 100% polyethylene panels to be used in external signage, which is just madness. Um, can, can I just ask a quick one? I'm not sure, I think you're the right person for this. It just has I'm to not. do with uh, certification. <laughs> Um, we're going to uh, the fire engineering thing. We've had the identification report. We're now waiting for the final version of the remediation report, which um, I met with um, the council um, engineer recently, and he said, yep, he's the guy who has to look at all that and sign off on it effectively. My question and concern is that our original certifier was the council. The building was completed in 2013. No, it would have been private enterprise certification. Yeah, but, we, but our certifier was the council. So they have the option of council or private certifier. We okay. have the council, which was Botany Council, which is now Bayside Council, and now Bayside Council is going to be the rectifier. Maybe it's one for you. Yes, I think it's the same type of question for Julian, and he's got yeah. at least 20 yeah. minutes to think about it. The rectifier is going to be in terms of covering error. We'll, we'll, yeah, look, it's one of these, so many of these grey areas around the whole strata from business and living in strata. The whole chain of building. Um, architecture, development, design, installation. We are the only people in that whole chain of building and buying apartments where the law says you have to fix the problem. You have to fix the problem. Even if you think somebody else is at fault, 
you still have to fix it and you can chase them for the money afterwards. When you're going to fix things, you need money. Where are you going to get the money? Are you going to do special levies? Are you going to finally go into that wonderful sinking fund that you've been adding to for the last 50 years and haven't taken any money out of? Ha. Or are you going to talk to our next speaker? He is basically Mr. Strata Finance for the whole of Australia. Hitler, He's the expert, he's the guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Morton. Um, because the only really relevant bit about my background that you need to know is that I used to be a musician. Now that's relevant because in my mid-twenties I started an economics degree. And I still remember the moment. I've only had about three or four epiphanies in my life and this was one of them. And I was reading the first chapter of this economics textbook and it said, we don't paraphrasing, give a shit about the way things ought to be. We're talking about the way things are. It's the difference in economics between normative economics, which is how things ought to be and what it should be like, and positive economics, which is the way things are. That puts me at enormous odds with the OCN, because the OCN is largely, mostly, about the way things ought to be. And it's obviously critical, because if we don't think about that, we're stuffed as a society. But for my session, I'm mostly talking in a very pragmatic way about the way things are. So I will say a few things which will upset the OCN people greatly. That's good. <laughs> We're going to have a big debate about it. But I'm coming from the focus of the way things are. But what's changed? Yesterday, I went to the optometrist, actually the eye doctor. And whilst I was there trying to pay my bill, somebody else was paying their bill with the other receptionist and they're having a conversation about things and it comes to the address and the receptionist said, I thought you had changed your flat in the building. And she said, no, I live on level four, I'm not going to go any higher because I'm worried about fire. I have never heard anybody in any conversation in the 15 years I've been in Strata ever mention the word fire as some consideration about why they might change or think differently about the way they live. My statistics lecturer said that an anecdote is not a statistic. So that's an anecdote, but let's see what happens to it. The other thing is the fire council fire officer, because we've had fire orders in the gazillions always before. What happens when a strata building gets a fire order? They seek an extension. And the council fire office says yes. And the reason they do it is because Mabel he lives on the 27th floor or the second floor, and the fire officer doesn't want to be responsible for Mabel being kicked out of her house because she has nowhere else to live. That same person now doesn't want to be responsible for Mabel dying. So it's going to be a complete turnaround in the way councils deal with fire orders. We know about the cross, but let's talk about Neo 200. What was the big issue with that fire in Melbourne? Was it four or five weeks ago, whenever it was? The big issue was that it had a rectangular floor plate about this thick. The flammable cladding was on the inside of an internal bank balcony about that big. The proportion of flammable cladding on that building is less than 2% of the facade. But there was a fire. So this bullshit about 30%, less than 30% cladding is okay. Neo has turned around. The other thing about Neo is that if you are any kind of policy officer, or if you are any kind of staid, conservative, sit on your hands committee member or owner, you could say, La Crosse was a one-off. Grenfell was a one-off. Yes, that's really sad, but in La Crosse in Australia, no one died, and that's the really important thing. Neo means that that person can't hold that opinion any longer. Now, I don't know if there's ever going to be another fire and apartment building in Australia ever again. I don't know if there's going to be one tonight. But we can no longer hold the opinion that it will never happen again. Neo has changed all of that. I first presented at a cladding seminar about two years ago, and one of the engineers on the panel said, from his experience of dealing with this, that and the other, and the amount of fraud that's been involved in the whole process, 
we call it nicely substitution, but the real world is, word is fraud. The real issue is, in his view, and I'm quoting him, 90% of the buildings with aluminium composite panels and strata in Australia have the wrong stuff. Now, I don't know if he's right or wrong either, but if he's right, the simple thing is that your building is now guilty until it's proven innocent. And that's the really critical thing which comes along with the changes of from compliance to is it safe, which is where I think our community and where our society and where eventually our, reg our regulations and legislation will be heading. <coughs> Let's just think about what cladding buildings are like, because it's not like every single strata in Australia. If you talk to a politician and to most strata managers, you'd be forgiven the thinking that strata was about residential owner occupancy. Well, it's not. At least 53% of, of New South Wales buildings, even in the residential strata, 53% of lots are owned by investors. No one knows this figure in Victoria or Queensland, but it's considered to be 60 to 65%. Now, as an aside, this is really quite interesting when you start to talk about negative gearing. Because strata is a way for the people who rent for whatever reason, because they can't afford to buy or because they like it or whatever it might be, strata is a way for those people to live, to have a dwelling, to have a house. And if you change the incentives for investors, suddenly we're talking about a big change in the way people actually live in Australia. Because it's about 10% of the population. Let's go back again. So in a high rise it's polyethylene, ethylene, and that's what we in New South Wales think. In Victoria they've got a lot of this low rise stuff. Buildings effectively made out of coolite. Two or three buildings. It's not such an issue for us here. Relatively recent construction. The most of them in the last 10 or 15 years. Yes, it goes back 30 years, but mostly these buildings are, in strata terms, relatively young. Relatively, or typically, the Capital Works funds are not established or sufficiently established. Don't get me started about Capital Works funds, because most people know my view on that. But that's the situation. I said I'd be pragmatic and positive economics here. Typically, not always, a high percentage of investors. <coughs> and typically relatively high gearing of the owners. That's important when we come to think about funding solutions. Who's going to pay? The government is not going to pay. Not on their nilly are they going to pay. We can activate, we can do all we want, and maybe they should pay, and maybe it is 100% they're culpable, but it's not going to happen, folks. They're not even going to help. So, we <laughs> build a developer. That's not going to happen either. They specialise in having single purpose companies for a particular building which they close down when it's all over. It's not there. Insurance. The insurance companies have teams of lawyers whose job is to obfuscate everything that a strata committee or strata owner or strata manager does. And the developers have aided in that by <coughs> what um, a strata lawyer who was in the industry used to call the developer provisions. So it's all the stuff in strata legislation which helps a developer. When it comes to litigation, it's, well, you can't do much. In fact, it's more than $250 per lot unless you have an approval in a general meeting. All these little things that get in the way of owners taking action, for example, in litigation. Owner, that's who's going to pay. Despite all the things that we are arguing about and the way life should be, Owner's going to pay. Let's get used to it and actually get on. Because if you spend the next six hours, six months, or six years of your life thinking anything different, then you've wasted a lot of your energy. Litigation I want to talk more about later, because there's some interesting things that happened there. Okay, this is the trick question. Only three of these ways are a way of funding strata. Now what happens in my business about, mm, not quite twice a year, but about once every nine months or so, I get a call from someone in the financial sector, typically some kind of investment banker or someone who works in structuring one of the large banks saying, let's get together because we want to work out a really good way of financing things in Australia. And I say, yes, of course, because I love having an hour of a cup of coffee with anybody who might be interesting. The answer is, there is no alternative. 
three of those ways work, one of them doesn't, there is nothing else. That's it. There's nothing else. And we know about these, so let's not waste our time talking about other stuff. I'll talk about trading rectification agreements later. The stu most stupid thing I think that the Tory government's done for a long time. So, when it actually comes to it, the Capital Works Fund, can you use it? Yes, you can. And you should. I'm the Australian lender, remember? It's money, it's there, it's available, use it. So why use it? Because it's there. Because, and this is not a topic about the economics of financing in Strata, which I could go on for a long time about, they are dormant, expensive funds, so get rid of them quickly. And there are limited tax benefits, which is associated with the second point, so get rid of them quickly. Now, this is probably counterintuitive to most of you, because most people in government, and most Strata managers, and most Strata owners think, what a great idea if we have a nice pot of money sitting there that we can use whenever we want to. And there are some nice things about that. But if we're talking about economic efficiency, it's not that. That's not one of the reasons. That's a reason not to use it. And it's something that Jimmy alluded to before. There's not enough money in the damn thing. This is probably a little bit off topic, but it's something to consider that in New South Wales, an owner's obligation is to consider each year what levy they want to make to the Capital Works Fund. I think that is extremely good legislation. Again, in different presentations, we talk about what are the options and why and how, and I'll play a bit of a flavor of that in this presentation. But I think it's really important to consider each year what you want. We're a group of a certain age or a certain demographic or a certain social status or whatever, and notwithstanding what this guy talks about the economics of strata, uh, strata, of strata funding, we just want everything sitting there on deposit. Fantastic. If that's your considered opinion of what you want, go for it. And you can keep on making that decision year after year. Um, but there are all these other things, these, these three other things that we can do. Now, we can remortgage our properties in order to pay for a special levy. Now, it's interesting. I've been talking to a lot of people. How much is this going to cost to fix? And the newspapers were pretty keen in coming out initially last year and saying it's going to be $50,000 per unit. Now, it's all over the shop. And we have got inquiries from people that it's going to be less than $10,000 per unit. And others where it's going to be significantly more than $60,000. It's guess $100,000 per unit. Perhaps twenty to 50000 per unit is a reasonable range. But I am saying that on the basis of my own guesstimates. I have not one shred of evidence to corroborate that. So the advantage of a special levy, uh, it's done and dusted. It's quick if everybody can pay. And it spreads the payments over for a long time. That's good for our cash flows. Disadvantage. For people who can't afford the special levy, and it's going to cause them to have to sell their property, it's not a really good time to do it. So there's a bit of economic um, a sort of equity going on there. There's a lot of great things about the Hain Royal Commission. I loved it. I don't love some of the outcomes of the Hain Royal Commission, some of which are collateral damage and some of which are unintended and never expected, but this is not a presentation about the Hain Royal Commission. But what it means is, in an era of a soft property market, meaning prices are going to decline slightly, where banks are really worried about the interest-only loans they have, which have to turn into principal and interest loans, where there's some kind of credit crunch being brought on in terms of moral responsibility and responsible lending and the liar loans and those sorts of things, it's going to be harder and harder for anyone, not just your average Joe, but anyone to get a mortgage, or to remortgage, or to even get a mortgage if you're on a fixed income or you're retired with no income at all. It is not possible in Australia now to get what's called an asset loan. Meaning, my asset's worth $10 million, please can I borrow 50000 No, they do not exist because, I was about to say the good because I'm getting on a bit of an emotional roll here and I said I'd be pragmatic. It has been deemed by the regulatory authorities that that sort of lending is bad lending practice. People have to be able to service their loans. So the asset land no longer exists. You can't get one. Um, tax advantages are limited as well. 
I've talked about that, so I ran ahead of myself. Can you borrow? Yes. Disadvantage is you have to pay the interest and ultimately you're going to have to pay the principal back as well. Advantage is quick. Yes, it's a solution. There is a significant tax advantage, which if there's time I'll talk a bit about later, for the majority of owners in Strata being investors. It's going to upset most of the people here who are probably residential owner occupiers. The fact that the person who doesn't live next door to you gets a tax advantage in the levy structure. But we're talking about pragmatics and the weighted average cost of funds and how it affects your building is cheaper, spreads it out over time. They don't exist. They're a fabrication of the new Victorian government. They're put into legislation in October last year. I could, have, I could send you my three-page paper on it with all the list of the issues, but they're not around. So if you're in a strata committee and people are talking about, oh, we can get one of these cladding rectification agreements, they've got them in Victoria, and New South Wales might introduce them. It's not going to what happen. Are they? they don't even have them. What are they? It's hard to describe. It's a basically a collaboration of a funder and the um, and the council, which rec which means that the funder can say, I feel good about making this loan to a strata because the council is going to collect the money for me. Wow. Now, anything more than that, and we're going to need 15 minutes. We don't have. Um, so, oh, the fact that the Victorian <coughs> government enacted legislation which doesn't comply with the Consumer Credit Code is quite an interesting thing. Litigation. Now, Julian will talk that more, but let me point it out. You're going to need to have a case. People sort of forget that. In their rush to want, somebody else must pay for this dreadful situation that I am in. It's somebody else's fault, not me. I'm not paying. And in Strata, that means I'm not doing anything, and I'm going to contribute to doing anything, and I'm going to get in the way of anybody who tries to do anything. You actually need to have a case. You need a great lawyer. Because these cases are somewhat hard, they need to have really good operational capacity, because there's lots of things that have to be lodged at particular times. You need deep pockets, and you need to go to the general meeting because deep pockets is more than $250,000 per lot. But this is the real thing, which is a pain in the ass for the legal community in dealing with strata. Strata's are poor clients. <coughs> to run a really good legal case, you need a co cohesive client who can quickly understand where you are and quickly make decisions so you can get on with things, and Strata corporations do not do that. Now, I'm actually quite in favour of the notion of litigation. This slide is not meant to put you off litigation. This slide is meant to say, organise yourselves and make sure you overcome your own deficiencies and don't blame the bloody lawyer, because he's actually probably doing a really great job. You need someone to sue, because if you're trying to sue that, de that developer or the builder and they've gone out of business, obviously it's not going to work. That top choice is basically what I thought, and I'm not saying it's true, I'm just saying it's what I thought, what's the case, the chance of getting a cladding case up. The L.U. Simon case may have changed that if it's, keep, if it's um, supported on appeal. In the, the L.U. Simon case says the builder can claim on the consultant's PI insurance. It used to be in litigation, are we going to litigate now? and then rectify later with the proceeds. So we're going to rectify now and then run the case. And people had their own views, and I used to stay out of that argument because I really didn't think I had much to offer. But I came more and more and more <coughs> on the position of rectify first, litigate later. I think probably, and this is an unformed view of mine, and I'd like to have more input on it, and your thoughts as well, what we should be doing is both at the same time. But I really believe you should run your legal case hard and fast and run it to the ground so that you know what's going on, rather than think, oh good, somebody else is responsible, we're going to sue, and in five years later maybe we'll have a result. Tax and strata, I don't have time to go. Right, let's go through that. What does it mean? Anybody who says that, insert your favourite form of funding there, is the best way of funding in strata, has rocks in their head. 
The answer is what's the best way to fund is always it depends on the financial situation of the owners, on the tax profile of the owners, on the type of owners in the building, the demographics of the owners, what the owners feel about life, the age of the owners, the cultural way they have it, their approach to debt, their approach to other things. There is no one size fits all in funding the club. We're not supposed to do anything sort of promotion, but I am going to do that bit of promotion. Thank you very much. A phrase we used to hear a lot a couple of years ago was forced sales. When buildings had deteriorated to the point they didn't have the funds, they were legally obliged to fix the defects in the building or the, the, the kind of building which is old. Do you anticipate we will hear about forced sales? And we're talking about 75% of owners forcing the other 25% to knock, to sell the building to a developer, to be knocked down and replaced. Do you, can you see that happening? Um, simple answer is no. Okay. The complex answer is always a bit more. more. First of all, do I see cladding <coughs> as being a thing which will instigate a rush of the 70% 70, the 70 rule in early termination and people selling to developers? No, I don't think so. That has proved to be so <coughs> difficult um, as to almost you know, the cases which the, the cases or say instances I mean of that happening I think are going to be a handful and they're going to be taking a huge amount of time so I don't see a rush to that. Okay. Are we going to see a lot of owners having to sell their property? I don't think so because I think uh, there's various scenarios which could play out but one of them is the Auckland scenario or the New Zealand scenario with leaky buildings. If and look it's a bit too early to tell so I can really just, all my, the only way my thinking is maybe more advanced than yours is I've just come up with a few ideas. Will people consider buildings guilty until proven innocent? I believe so, but let's see what happens in the market with that. Will continue, property prices continue to soften? Probably. I don't think it's a real disaster in the property market, but I'm not a property market expert. Will banks find it extremely difficult to lend to cladding affected buildings. Absolutely, you bet they are piss scared and they're running like crazy. At least the ones I've talked to are. In Auckland, there's a blacklist of buildings where if you want to buy in that building, you cannot get a bank loan. If you talk to the banks in Auckland, there's no such thing as a blacklist. But I expect that's going to happen here. You're going to find it very hard to get a mortgage either to fund that special levy or to make that purchase. Now, I've heard a statistic which I can't verify, which is in London, cladding affected properties have gone down to 20% of their value. That just seems astonishing to me. I can't quite believe it, but it was a very credible source of told me. So in that case, what happens is it's moribund. No one sells because no one's going to buy or they're not prepared to sell at such an artificially, and what I mean by artificially, yes, it's correct, but it's a temporary decrease to your value. When you can invest $50,000 to get your value back, and perhaps invest the extra 30% to do the other things in order to improve your building at the same time and actually claw back some RO, um, return on investment, return on equity, that's the obvious thing to do. No, I, sorry, sorry, you, I, I, missed out, I missed out my slide about the big promotion. We have made a public commitment, very publicly in Victoria and also in Sydney. Lanark will fund 100% of the rectification costs of all starter buildings. Any other questions? How do you secure the mortgage? We don't have a body corporate, or what do you do? We make an unsecured loan, so there's no mortgage, there's no security, there's no equitable mortgage over assets, there's no liens, charges, caveats, anything like that. It's a contract for the supply and the repayment of money. And it's, in that sense, the obligations are exactly the same as the cleaning content co contract or the building contract. That's an unsecured, actually the building contract is secure, sorry, for secure repayment stuff. So it's an unsecured contract. And sort of what are the interest rate that's applicable is? It will depend, but at the moment we're in the mid sevens. If it continues to be soft in Australia, it'll go down a little bit. 7%, so it's basically just like all you're doing is supplying money to yes. the trust. Yes, so there's a contract for supplying money. Cleaning, supplying anything, it's supplying money. I have to come in here, um, having used your product, it's actually really important to understand, even though the interest rate is quite bad, if 
you've got a good cash flow already in your capital funds, mm -hmm. you don't have to pay that interest for terribly long. So there are ways to, to, to take advantage of that and, and soften things out. Every situation is different, but if you're already no, paying I'll take, into I'll take, I'll take a capital work fund, thank you. <laughs> if you're already contributing some halfway decent amount to a capital maintenance to the capital works fund or the maintenance fund, then it can be that you could actually reduce your levies in that sense. But I don't really want to push that because that's almost exceptional. With this lady here, oh, sorry. Just do you lend on market value or the building value? We actually do have a matrix based on the building value. So the maximum loan that we will do is 35% of the building value. So if it's a block of 10 and the units are worth 500,000 each, then we'll say we'll lend 35% of 5 million. So uh, that's market, that's market value or, 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 or replacement value? Market value. Or insured or value. No, we don't do insured value. Yeah. What's, what's the typical length of term of the loan? What do they vary? The average that people draw from us is for 82 months, so that's seven years. Uh, our maximum is 15 years, but typically people draw for seven, five, or 10. Okay. In cladding cases, I would expect 10 or 15 should be the way to go. Um, so that's an answer to your question. Yes? I have a question about people that are in currently own in an apartment that has cladding on it, and what if circumstances, you know, they have to move overseas or something, so they want to now sell their apartment. Mm -hmm. Have they got to declare that in their, when they put the mark? The I don't know the answer to that question. It depends yeah. on the state. Some states uh, have legislated that you have to notify on sale um, that you have a uh, effective building. Um, Queensland is you have to put a plaque up outside. This is an effective building. Wow. Well, right. Particular expertise in product liability claims. He recently concluded two class actions in the Federal Court of Australia in relation to medical devices, one of which led to a landmark $250 million settlement. He is now conducting a consumer class action against Volkswagen, I'm glad I mentioned that earlier, and with Skoda um, arising from the diesel gate issue. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julian Shin. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, I'm here to talk about legal options in relation to the uh, cladding issue um, and just to sort of pick up on something that Paul said towards uh, the end of his presentation, what I would say is rectify now um, because the reality of the Australian legal system is that it will take a number of years to litigate anyway. Um, so the way that I'm looking at the issue is that um, uh, owners need to deal with a, a pretty complicated uh, and potentially costly uh, issue. Finance is, is available to deal with rectification in, in the short term, um, but, but what I'm interested in is um, who's going to pay at the end of the day. There's a couple of couple of different legal options that, um, that, that are available to owners. Uh, really, I want to talk about the, the second of these options, um, but it's worth mentioning um, the first option, uh, owners' corporations can, of course, uh, take individual legal action against people who are involved in the, in the building process. That's what we've seen in the, in the La Crosse uh, litigation in, 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 in Victoria. Um, action taken against the builder, the architect, uh, the fire engineer and the surveyor um, and at the end of the day in that case really it was the um, the architect, the fire engineer and the surveyor who really had to pay um, it, it, as a result of the judgment that was given a, a few weeks ago. Um, as for class actions, so I don't know what everyone thinks about class actions, what everyone knows about class actions. I put this slide up in black to create a kind of sense of um, foreboding um, class actions generate, um, they generate headlines, um, depending on what sort of newspaper you read, the, the headlines can vary. Um, if you read only News Limited uh, newspapers, probably you've got quite a negative impression of class actions. Um, so really, uh, the reality though of the class action system, which we've had since 1992, so for around um, just over 27 years, um, it, it's, a, it's a mainstream legal procedure 
Um, there have been about 530 class actions in those 27 years, so around 20 a year. Um, hundreds of thousands of uh, people in Australia have benefited um, fr from class actions in Australia, and there, there's been around 3.5 billion in compensation that's paid to um, Australians in, in, in those 27 years. So really what I want to do is to sort of do a bit of a class actions 101 uh, to, to begin with. So. Uh, th these three sort of pillars, they're the, they're the kind of policy um, reasons why we have a class actions regime. Access to justice, not everyone has the resources or wherewithal to start their own legal case. Um, reduced legal costs, class actions are expensive to run, um, but the way that we think about it is the sort of per claimant legal cost. So if it costs you $5 million to run a class action, you've got 500 people who are benefiting from it, that's around $10,000 $10, each. Um, these days, $10,000 won't get you very far in, in the Australian legal system. So, so the sort of per claimant cost is really um, uh, the way to think about it. Efficiency is, if you've got hundreds of people who, who have all got the same claim, it means you don't need to re-litigate hundreds of times the same issue that arises uh, in, in all of those cases. So if there's a defective product, um, ha having hundreds of different litigants all needing to prove that there was a, a, a defect in the, in the problem. This stuff, I'll just sort of skip over this, the, the sort of uh, um, the, the legal requirements for a class action. These, these are three legal requirements in the, in the class actions regime. They're the sort of glue that make uh, a, num a number of different claims stick together as a class action. And it's pretty easy to, to see how those requirements might be met uh, in the context of um, building owners whose buildings have, uh, have cladding on them. So there's hundred, we know about hundreds of buildings uh, across Australia, there's a similarity to the to the circumstances insofar as the buildings were constructed um, using particular uh, cladding products um, and commonality. The, the claims all give rise to this, to, to to common um, legal questions about the suitability of those products being used um, and and whether or not they were defective uh, in a legal sense. Um, just briefly as well, so the class actions regime over 27 years has been a, a, a huge variety of people who have really benefited uh, from it. Um, what, what I've done most of my work in is the, is the fourth category, um, defective products, um, and that's the way that we're looking um, at, the, at the cladding issue as well as a, as a defective product um, that should never have been um, used on hundreds of build, buildings in Australia. Um, so the, 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 the structure of a class action is worth talking a little bit about um, as, as well. Um, uh, not a lot of people have got appetite to, um, to be litigants, um, and, and this is really the benefit uh, of the class actions regime. So we have a representative plaintiff, so one, one plaintiff um, who brings the case in their own name and on behalf of class members, so all the other people, who, who are in the class that they define, so all other uh, building owners uh, whose buildings have cladding on it. Um, and, and the benefit of that really is that the class members in the class section can really take a back seat, they can take a passive role uh, in, in the class section for, for much of the class action. Um, they don't, you don't need to run your own race, um, retain your own lawyers, provide instructions to your lawyers and sort of work on a one-on-one -on -one uh, way with lawyers in, in, in running the litigation. The reason for that is that, uh, 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 that, that there is this commonality of issues that you'll see there, co common issues of fact and law which really span uh, the claim of the representative plaintiff and also the, um, all of the class members. So that's questions like, is the, pro is the product def defective in, in a legal sense? Uh, but is it unsuitable to be used on um, high-rise residential buildings? And so the representative plaintiff sort of leads the charge on behalf of class members who get the benefit of favourable um, findings in relation to those common issues. It is the case though that the, 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 the representative plaintiff can only take things um, so far. Um, there are aspects of, uh, of, of people's claims that are unique to them, the facts are unique to the circumstances of their own claim. And the most uh, sort of, or the, the most, uh, uh, or the biggest category in, in that regard is the sort of individual um, loss that people have suffered. So the, the damages that individuals 
um, want to claim in the litigation and that it comes to stage and there's a variety of different ways that the, the class action system deals with that. Um, but at some stage of the process, um, there's a requirement for establishing um, uh, individual loss that's been suffered by, uh, by individuals. So the way that we're looking at it, um, like I said, uh, and like many of you will know, the, the La Cross uh, litigation focused on the people who are involved in the, in the design and construction process. Um, it may well be the case that builders and others uh, made bad decisions, made poor decisions in, in choosing and using um, flammable cladding products, but, but really at the end of the day, the way that we're looking at it is that the cladding is a dud product. It should never have been, regardless of whether or not it com complies with the, with the Building Code of Australia um, and, and various standards that, that, that Peter talked about earlier, the view that we take is that, that these products should never have been um, used on facades in, in residential buildings, um, particularly medium and high-rise buildings. So the, the legal basis for the, for the claims that we're looking at, um, uh, the Australian Consumer Law um, has a number of um, provisions that allow um, people who acquired um, faulty products, defective products, to, to take legal action. There is a, a statutory um, guarantee in any context of um, supply of a product to um, people that um, the product is of what's called acceptable quality. Um, so that, that, that's the first one. Secondly, um, we saw before the quite terrifying footage that, um, that Peter put up um, earlier. We, we would say that um, the, the cladding products are, are goods that have a safety defect. There's a safety problem um, uh, with those goods and there's specific provision um, in the Australian consumer law for um, people to recover compensation that they've suffered loss because they've been acquired, uh, that they've been supplied a, um, a, 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 a product that has a, a safety defect. Um, the third one, uh, the third type of claim that we're really looking at is a is a is an unconscionability claim. So Pe Peter touched on this a bit as well about um, how long it's been known um, that the uh, cladding has fire risk. So well, I was reading a few weeks ago that um, it, it was even as early as 1968. Um, uh, the, in relation to the Lucabon product in Germany, there were some questions that started to be asked in relation to it, um, and, and sort of continuing from there throughout the throughout the 80s. Uh, I think this is even referenced in the um, in the judgment uh, from, from VCAT in relation to the La Crosse building. They discussed some of that really early knowledge um, about the potential risks of the product, and um, and yet we've had you know this incredibly widespread um, promotion and use of the product. Um, in, in Australia, sort of really snowballing from the throughout the 90s, um, and, and we say that's unconscionable. If you know that the product's got these risks, and, and but you're still allowing it um, to be used on um, on buildings, we say that's a problem. That's a breach of the Australian consumer law um, because it's unconscionable for um, the supplier to have done that. So what we're looking at is a. Um, a class action, or, pro or probably a, a number of class actions uh, against the manufacturer and supplier of ACP um, products. Um, uh, the Australian Consumer Law allows us to go after the manufacturer and the supplier. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on a Luca bond, so that's um, manufactured by a company called 3A Composites, which is a subsidiary of a large um, uh, company that's listed on the Swiss um, Stock Exchange. Um, and there's an Australian supplier, an exclusive Australian supplier in relation to the, to the Luca Bond product. Um, we're also, and we've got instructions from, a, from an owner's corporation to investigate and pursue um, that, that particular class action. Um, other products might follow in separate cases because we're focusing on um, products, um, we'll probably structure things so that there, there, there are separate um, class actions that deal with the um, separate products that we're talking about. Um, one thing just to note, um, the, the way that we're looking at the, the representative and also the class members who I spoke about before, um, we're seeing the, 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 those as being the owners' corporations um, themselves rather than individual unit owners. Uh, the, the main reason for that is that um, the cladding predominantly, as we understand it, is part of the common property on buildings. Um, so the common property is owned by the owners' corporation rather than by individual um, unit, unit owners. 
Um, so really it's the owner's corporation that has the legal claim um, in the first place. Um, uh, so and then there's other building owners as well that we're looking at. I mean, we're, we're, the way that we're looking at it, it's not limited to um, built residential buildings, but we're, we're, we're interested in commercial buildings um, as well. What can be claimed in a, in a, in a class section? The aim, is, the, the aim of the class section is to, is to compensate. So it's to put you uh, in the position you would have been in if the problem hadn't occurred in the first place. And there's sort of two broad um, categories. Um, of loss, there's the sort of cost of remedial measures, um, removal of the cladding, risk mitigation measures, um, cost of investigations. You might go to Paul in the short term to get finance to carry out carry out those um, remedial measures, but at the end of the day, <coughs> owners' corporations are, are going to have a debt. Um, we see the class action as a means to repay the debt um, at the end of the day. Um, there's also consequential losses that might flow from that, so interest that uh, has been paid over the years in, in, in relation to any loans, um, increased insurance premiums and, and, and things like that. Um, just, to, just on that note, I guess a little sort of practical um, side note, sort of, um, and also going to what I said earlier about the reality is that um, legal cases take a number of years, is the importance of record keeping, um, so expenditure that's um, that, that's been incurred, um, costs that have been paid all along the way can um, get quite tricky in my experience if you're three years down the track from having actually done that to sort of recreate history and try to kind of patch together um, all, all the expenses that have been incurred quite a number of years ago. Um, just a, a brief discussion on um, how costs work in, in class actions. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of um, two main funding models that we use. So one is lawyers acting on a on a no no in no fee basis. So what that means is um, we say that we think we're confident that the case is going to win. So we take a punch on our fees. We don't make anyone pay um, our legal costs along the way. Um, we only get paid if we win the case at the end of the day. Um, the second option is uh, third party litigation funding. This is a sort of relatively new phenomenon, but it has become quite accepted in particularly in the class actions area and a couple of other areas of law over the last decade or so. So third party will come in um, and effectively finance the, lit the litigation. Um, they pay the lawyers along the way. Um, they uh, take on the risk of um, the, the representative plaintiff losing the case. So we've got a loser pays a cost system in, in the legal system in Australia. So the litigation funder comes in and takes on that risk on, on behalf of the, the represent, representative uh, plaintiff. The catch is that the, um, the litigation funder takes a commission, which is usually, usually expressed as a, as a percentage of, of damages at the end of the day. What, to be honest with you, we haven't settled on which of these options we're, um, we're, we're looking at for a, for a cladding um, scenario. The instructions that we've got from an owner's corporation are to um, uh, investigate the merits of the case and think about the best sort of, um, uh, best sort of way of funding, um, funding the case on, on behalf of other um, building owners. The important thing to note though in relation to um, both of these funding options is that individual um, building owners would not need to actually pay anything for the conduct of the litigation. Paul, I think, in one of his slides says that to run litigation you need um, deep pockets. That's not necessarily the case with these sorts of funding models that, um, that are in place and, and commonly used in a, in a class action context. So uh, there's no, uh, in either of these options, there's no uh, requirement to contribute to the, to the conduct of, of the case while it's on foot. Um, and also for, at least as far as class members are, are concerned, um, in both of these models, there is no risk of um, owners, corporations needing to pay anything if the case is unsuccessful. A bit about Morris Blackburn, our um, firm's been around for exactly 100 years. Um, we, um, we've got the stomach for the fight and we've got a good track record in class actions. We've, out of the 3.5 billion in compensation or in settlements in, in Australian class action, um, history, we're responsible, our firm is responsible for about 70% uh, of that. Um, we've got nine of the top 10 class action settlements in Australian history, so uh, we, um, we run the big cases and we get the big um, settlements at the end of the day. Um, so, anyway, sorry to 
impose that on all of you. It always feels a bit um, awkward saying that sort of thing, but there you go. Um, so that's all I wanted to say in terms of a um, sort of uh, set piece. Any yeah, questions? Well, suppose we do rectification, join a class action, the rectification costs a million bucks. At the end of the day, if it's successful, once you've got your fee, the yeah. underwriter's got their fee, do we get a million bucks or do we get a percentage of a million bucks? Yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty, pretty good question. Um, um, sorry, I should have been more, more clear about this. It does depend a little bit on which of the two funding models we use. So um, in the first scenario, which is we run the case on a no no fee basis, um, if we know that there are, let's say, just for argument's sake, a, um, 100 buildings who, who are in the class or who are our clients, um, the value of their claims is say $100 million. Um, when we go to sell, and let's say our legal fees are, um, which is around number 10 million bucks, um, when we go to um, have a mediation and try to settle the case, um, what we're saying is look, you need to pay us 100 million bucks plus our legal costs because we've got a loser pays legal system in Australia. So if on the other hand, we have to litigate all the way to the, um, to the end of the process um, and we win, it's the defendants who pay our costs on top of the um, damages that are payable to, um, to the claimants in the case. So, um, so that's, the, um, that's obviously a, the most favourable scenario for, for owners' corporations. The drawback of that first scenario that you know in no fee basis is that there's an owner's corporation that needs to take a pretty big punt on winning the case. So it's a loser pays legal system. The representative plaintiff, if the case is unsuccessful, will be on the hook for millions of dollars in legal costs which need to be paid to the defendant. There's a bit of a trade-off here. That, that's one of the reasons why we get a third party funder involved because it provides that protection um, to the representative plaintiff in particular um, to take the case on on behalf of all of the class members. And the third party funder indemnifies the representative plaintiff for or adverse costs, the cost of the, the, the defendant. Um, but obviously that risk that the funder assumes comes, comes at a cost. And the cost is that the funder for taking on that, that risk and also for paying the lawyers along the way, um, the funder takes a, a commission at the end of the process. So in that sort of a scenario, the owners corporations won't get the, the full amount back. We should, should have been upfront about that um, when I was giving my presentation. But um, you know, there's there's merits and drawbacks of both of the of both of the um, scenarios. I think that's important to bear in mind. If you can't settle in in a, a mediation, for example, yeah, uh, isn't the practice that you get sixty, maybe seventy percent of your costs? No, uh, it just it just depends. So if you if you have to litigate all, all, all the way, you might get your what are called party party costs, and there might be a shortfall. Yeah. Um, distributed across a whole bunch of people, that's probably um, no. It's, it's probably yeah. They might need to make a contribution if there if there's a shortfall, but it's probably um, it's probably a bit at the margins. I'd suggest um, having regard to the um, the, 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 amounts of the, of the size of the claim. Yeah. That you know, just, what's the normal commission for a third party funder? Um, it, it depends. So, um, so uh, common market rates for, for that sort of setup these days might be um, between about 25 and 33 that's, percent. That's that's pretty common. Depends which funder we're talking about. Depends what they see the risk of the case as, um, what what the budget for legal costs is, etc. So they're they're doing they're doing their own risk analysis and they're calibrating the commission um, accordingly. I'm just interested from a sticky point point of view, but in the early Simon case, given that presumably they substituted the Chinese product for Lucabon, and the Chinese product would have cost them, or cost the fabricator in store about $10 a square metre less, plus the wastage, plus his margin, why weren't they liable for some of that? The Cost delta, the delta between a Luca bond and a Luca best, yeah, and the savings, which in the scheme of the project was probably 0.02 of a percent. Yeah, but they still took it. They took the saving. They took the VE. But the, I think the judge in that case surprised a lot of people to the level of detail he went down to to apportion uh, the costs 
that were paid because basically that case said L.U. Simon owed the owners' corporation a big chunk of money, mm. and then the judge said, but meanwhile, all these other parties owe L.U. Simon yeah, right. mm. different mm. amounts of money. So those things and effectively covered L.U. Simon. Yeah. Who, yeah. Uh, apart the from way the now that the construction industry works, they ran the building. Correct. And so they, they've gone, but you see, that's why I asked the question if the, the specification from the architect was descriptive or yeah. descriptive. So they've said a Luca bond or similar, yeah. and that's it. Right. And I understand that. 